Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life and crimes of the habitual offender, Ernesto Miranda. Ernesto Arturo Miranda was born on the 9th of March 1940 in Mesa, Arizona. He was the second child born to Manuel and Isabel Miranda, who already had an eight-year-old son called Manuel Jr. In 1944, when Ernesto was four years old, his mother gave birth to another boy, who they named Albert, who was sadly stillborn. Just over two years later, on the 28th of December 1946, Ernesto's mother, Isabel, died. Ernesto was just six years old at the time, in less than a year, Ernesto's father, Manuel, had remarried. Ernesto did not like his stepmother and his relationship with his father became increasingly strained. He started to skip school and at the age of 14 was convicted of burglary and sent away to a reform school, the Arizona State Industrial School for Boys at Fort Grant. When he was released, he re-offended within weeks and was sent straight back. By the time he was released for a second time, he was estranged from his entire family and decided to head to California. Additional arrests followed and when Ernesto was 18 years old, he was deported from California back to Arizona and, after more arrests along with time spent living on the streets, he decided that he would enlist in the army in an attempt to bring some stability to his life. However, this did little to curb his criminal tendencies and after going AWOL and being charged with various sexual offences, he ended up completing hard labour at Fort Campbell, Kentucky and being dishonourably discharged after just 15 months of service. Further criminal activity and arrests followed with various convictions including being sentenced to a year in the medium security federal reformatory in Ohio after driving a stolen car across state lines. On the day before his release he was visited by some friends and as he said goodbye to them an electric gate slammed shut on his hand chopping off the top third of his right index finger. Upon his release now aged 21, he returned to Arizona and soon after met a 29-year-old lady by the name of Twyla Hoffman. The couple quickly began living together along with Twyla's two young children from a previous marriage. Twyla and Ernesto had a baby girl who they named Cleopatra and Ernesto began working as a labourer in an attempt to earn an honest wage. However, this attempt at an honest life was short-lived. On the 2nd of March 1963, an 18-year-old cinema employee was returning home after her shift. The cinema had been showing the 1962 film The Longest Day, which, with a runtime of 2 hours and 58 minutes, meant that she was out much later than usual. As she walked up Marlette Street in Phoenix, a car approached her and the driver jumped out. Telling the young woman to be quiet, he pushed her into the back seat before driving away. He then drove for around 20 minutes before parking the car and then sexually assaulting and robbing his victim. He then drove back and dropped the young woman about four blocks from her home. The young woman rushed to her house, hysterical, and her sister called the police. The lady, whose identity was not revealed and as such was referred to as Jane Doe, initially described her attacker as a Mexican male in his late 20s, around 5 feet 11 inches tall, with a slender build, medium complexion and black short-cut curly hair. He was wearing Levi's, a white t-shirt and dark rim glasses. However, when later questioned further, she said that she could not be certain of her facts and stated that her attacker did not speak with an accent and may in fact have been of Italian descent. She described the car as either grey or green, with dark upholstery and stripes. The police had very little information to go on. Around a week later, a member of Jane Doe's family saw a car matching the description cruising around their neighbourhood. This relative believed that this may have been the car used in the assault. It was a 1953 Packard and part of the number plate was DFL, Delta Foxtrot Lima. This information was investigated by the police and a match was found. 
The car belonged to Twyla Hoffman. The police visited her house at 2525 West Maricopa, where she lived with Ernesto. When they arrived early in the morning, Ernesto was in bed having just completed a night shift at work. Ernesto asked the police what they wanted, and the police indicated that they would prefer not to talk to him in front of his family. The police then drove Ernesto to the police station to be interviewed. He was not under arrest nor handcuffed. The Phoenix Police Department also knew of several other unsolved crimes where the perpetrator matched Ernesto's description. One of these was the armed robbery of a bank employee by the name of Barbara McDaniel. At the police station, Ernesto agreed to take part in the lineup for both Jane Doe and Barbara McDaniel. Reports vary as to how convinced these two ladies were that Ernesto was their attacker. Some say they positively identified him, whilst others say there was no recognition whatsoever. Regardless of that, when Ernesto asked the police how he had done, they told him that he had been positively identified during the lineup and suggested to him that a confession now would help him further down the line. Ernesto then confessed. After he admitted his crimes, Shockingly, Ernesto was taken to meet Jane Doe in order for her to identify and confirm his voice. When Ernesto was brought into the room, he was asked if this was the woman that he had attacked in some kind of strange reversed lineup. He replied, that's the girl, and from this, Jane Doe positively identified his voice. Ernesto then wrote his confession. At the top of the page, there was a typed paragraph stating that this statement has been made voluntarily and of my own free will, with no threats, coercion or promises of immunity, and with full knowledge of my legal rights, understanding any statement I make can and will be used against me. The case went to trial in June 1963. The prosecution's case was almost entirely based on Ernesto's confession. A confession which Ernesto subsequently claims he had been coerced into making. This accusation was fully denied by the officers involved. The jury of three women and nine men unanimously returned a verdict of guilty and Ernesto was sentenced to 20 to 30 years for each crime, the attack and the armed robbery. These would run concurrently. His lawyers appealed to the Arizona Supreme Court on the basis that the confession may not have been made voluntarily and also questioned whether Ernesto was afforded all the safeguards to his rights provided by the Constitution of the United States and the laws of the courts. Ernesto's conviction was upheld by the Arizona Supreme Court. Then, in June 1965, a request was submitted to the US Supreme Court to hear an appeal. In November 1965, the court agreed to hear Miranda v. Arizona. Ernesto's lawyers claimed that, even though Ernesto's confession was written under a statement confirming that he was fully aware of his legal rights, these had not been made explicitly clear to him and therefore his confession should not have been deemed admissible in court. The Supreme Court decision went in favour of Ernesto and on a 5-4 majority reversed the Arizona Supreme Court's decision. It was decided that, due to Ernesto being interrogated for two hours without being informed of either his right to remain silent or his right to counsel, his confession could not be used in court. As a result of this ruling, all police departments across the United States issued Miranda warning cards to their officers to recite. They read, You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney and to have an attorney present during questioning. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided to you at no cost. During any questioning, you may decide at any time to exercise these rights, not answer any questions or make any statements. Do you understand these rights as I have read them to you? I understand that some states along the US-Mexico border also add a line. If you are not a United States citizen, you may contact your country's consulate prior to any questioning. Ernesto's conviction for the attack on Jane Doe was set aside, but he remained in prison due to the armed robbery conviction. Apparently, 
he learns of the Supreme Court's decision while watching television in the Arizona State Prison. Determined to get justice for Jane Doe, the investigating officers re-arrested Ernesto. He was Mirandized and charged with the attack. The new trial was due to take place in October 1966, but had to be postponed as Jane Doe, who had by then married, was due to give birth to her first child around that time. The prosecution case could no longer rely on Ernesto's confession, but by this time they had a new witness, Twyla Hoffman. Twyla advised that she had visited Ernesto in jail shortly after his arrest. During this visit, Twyla claimed that Ernesto confessed to the attack and asked Twyla to visit Jane Doe's family and tell them that he promised to marry Jane Doe if she agreed to drop all charges against him. He told Twyla he would then return to her, but he just needed to avoid going to prison first. Understandably, Twyla then distanced herself from Ernesto and would not allow him to see their daughter. Twyla's testimony, along with Jane Doe's account of the events, led the four men and eight women of the jury to return a guilty verdict after less than an hour and a half of deliberation. Ernesto was once again sentenced to 20 to 30 years for this crime. He was paroled from the Arizona State Prison in December 1972 after serving around 11 years. After his release, he returned to a life of crime and supplemented his criminal income by selling autographed Miranda warning cards for $1.50 each. He was caught with a gun in his possession and, even though the charges against him were dropped, he served another year for parole violation. He was released again in December 1975 and began living in cheap hotels in the Phoenix area. On the 31st of January 1976, he visited the La Amapola Bar in Phoenix where he was drinking and playing cards with two men, 23-year-old Fernando Rodriguez and Ezequiel Marino, who was also 23. The card game turned sour and descended into a fight. Ernesto knocked Ezekiel down with one punch and then started upon Fernando. The bartender threatened to call the police and the fight soon broke up. Ernesto went into the toilet to clean himself up and, when he returned, Ezekiel had armed himself with a knife. A scuffle followed, during which time Ernesto was stabbed and Ezekiel ran away. Ernesto lay bleeding on the filthy bar floor before being transported to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Phoenix. The 34-year-old was pronounced dead on arrival. The police caught up with Ezekiel at the nearby Salt River Hotel where he was, ironically, read his Miranda rights before being questioned. However, whilst the case was being investigated, Ezekiel absconded, possibly to Mexico and has never been found. I would just like to say thank you to Team Jesus, or it could be Team Jesus, for suggesting this video. Thanks very much for the suggestion, TJ. Cheers. Please add any comments down below about this case. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Two district attorneys, Doris Mayer, and Harold Berliner wrote the Miranda rights. Harold had a side business in printing. He printed the Miranda warning cards on vinyl so they would still work if they were accidentally laundered. Goodbye.